All right, here we are uh, at the Defined Podcast with Mike Silagatze, founder and CEO of EtherFi, the top liquid restaking protocol with almost 3 billion of TVL, and Nikhil Raguvira, co-founder of Athos, a decentralized pol policy engine for smart contracts. Thank you both for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks so much. So super excited uh, f for um, for this interview. Of course, uh, restaking, liquid restaking has been probably the hottest trend on Ethereum this year, um, and uh, AVSs is, is what makes this whole system, uh, you know, viable. So uh, excited to have Nikhil here to uh, get into, you know, all the details on that. Um, I was uh, just telling Mike that I was seeing where we were where we were at when we last had him on the podcast. So uh, Mike was on the Defiant podcast in July last year when EtherFi had less than 50 million of TVL. Um, Eigenlayer hadn't opened its vaults. There were no points mania, no tokens. Um, Uh, just no no bull market. It was a totally different time. Uh, so yeah, great to have you on again, Mike. Uh, in you know after everything that's passed, it's just like a completely different uh, ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been absolutely crazy. I think we, um, you know, we got super lucky with timing um, uh, in in just when we we actually launched and. Uh, Uh, with the market, and of course, I think we, we built a pretty good product that really resonated with uh, with users. So it was just a lightning in a bottle, just a combination of a lot of things that came together to create a really, uh, really kind of remarkable uh, situation. Yeah, no, happy to hear. And, and let's start with that. If uh, you can provide a brief overview of what EtherFi is, and then Nikhil, our, I'll ask you to do the same about Athos. Yeah, maybe I'll start uh, a little bit at the beginning, uh, just for for people maybe that aren't as uh, in the weeds of, uh, of crypto and, and Ethereum, uh, and, and explain a little bit about you know what is staking, what is restaking, and what what is EtherFi, and what are we hoping to build on top of that. Um, so, um, uh, staking is a core component of the Ethereum uh, consensus uh, mechanism. Um, it is the way that Ethereum uh, is. Uh, 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 secured in, in, in many ways. Um, uh, and the way that it works mechanically is users deposit 32 ETH in a special contract on Ethereum. So they put 32 ETH in a, in a contract in exchange for having the right to run a, a server, a computer that uh, processes transactions on the Ethereum uh, network. Um, and the reason they do that is because they get rewarded with uh, fees, with rewards in exchange for running that uh, server. But they take some risk. Uh, the risk they take is that if their server that they're they're running uh, misbehaves, it double signs a block or does other kind of uh, nefarious actions, then they stand to lose that 32 ETH, which is you know close to $100,000 uh, worth of uh, ETH tokens. Uh, they stand to to lose that. So they're putting that ETH at stake in exchange for earning uh, rewards. So, uh, so that's the foundational uh, component of uh, how Ethereum. Uh, consensus and, and the protocol works. Um, the uh, one issue with that is that in order to uh, to stake your ETH, you have to lock up $100,000 worth of ETH. And then you can't use it for, for anything else. Uh, you can't uh, use it as collateral. You can't. You really can't do anything else with it. Um, and so as a result, uh, protocol smart contracts were developed to issue receipt tokens Uh, to users in exchange for staking their ETH, as well as pooling uh, staked ETH so that users don't have to provide $100,000. They can participate with a smaller amount of ETH. Uh, and then that receipt token can then be used in other DeFi projects to use as collateral, to borrow against the trade, to provide liquidity, to do all the great stuff that you can do in, uh, uh, in DeFi. And the first generation of these protocols, the main two were Lido and Rocket Pool, which did a really great job of getting up to billions and billions of dollars in uh, uh, in deposits. I think Lido is over 30 billion, 35 billion in deposits now. So they're they're really massive. They're still kind of the kings of the of this space. Um, uh, so what EtherFi was uh, designed to be is really a next generation staking protocol. Um, we think that eventually this component that EtherFi has, which is restaking, um, is going to be table stake for all all staking protocols. This isn't there's not going to be two categories liquid staking and liquid restaking. There's really going to be one category around liquid staking and 
everybody is just going to be restaking because that's where most of the the rewards are, are going to uh, come from. And so specifically, what is uh, what are the the uh, components of restaking? The basic idea is actually quite simple. It's you've got this ETH that you've used to secure. Ethereum, and you're taking on some risk, as I described, uh, for that. But that risk is quite small. Empirically speaking, very, very small risk. And you can buy insurance against that uh, slashing risk uh, uh, for just a few basis points. Because empirically, it's it just very, it's very rare that slashing uh, happens. So, and so uh, the idea is, well, what if you could utilize that same ETH to provide security to other networks and services? Uh, services that are called AVSs in the nomenclature today, uh, uh, actively validated uh, services. Um, and that basically is what restaking is. You can reuse that same ETH to provide security to other blockchains, to Oracle networks, to policy engines, as we'll, we'll hear in a minute, uh, uh, to a variety of different services in exchange for earning fees and rewards from those other uh, networks. And so EtherFi has that built in. That's it's, it's part of our core foundational design is that it supports restaking from the get-go so the user doesn't need to do anything. They just stake their ETH and it's automatically done for them. Uh, we launched this uh, liquid restaking uh, token and protocol back in November uh, and have had a crazy run-up to over $3 billion, uh, in, in TVL uh, and uh, have now started to launch a suite of products built uh, on top of that that you know, I'm happy to talk about later. Um, so, okay, hopefully that was a good uh, primer on EtherFi and staking and restaking. It was awesome primer. Just one one follow up question, Mike. If you can clarify how um, eigenlayer plays a role in all this. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have uh, I should have mentioned that. Uh, so eigenlayer is the platform that facilitates restaking. We we made a uh, over a year ago when we were first launching EtherFi when we raised our seed round when we were getting started. We made a, a bet. We made a huge bet. The restaking and eigenlayer in particular were going to be the the next big. You know, wave, I guess, in uh, uh, in Ethereum and in, in crypto. Um, I mean, we had no idea. Uh, honestly, uh, we, it, it exceeded our expectations in, in pretty much every way. But um, uh, that turned out to be a very good bet on Eigenlayer. So Eigenlayer is the core platform that facilitates all of this uh, restaking, and, and Etherfi is built uh, on top of that. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, now Nikhil on what's Athos. Yeah, sure. And Mike, thanks for a very comprehensive introduction to uh, liquid restaking. So what Athos is, is we're basically a decentralized policy engine that allows applications, projects, ecosystems to be able to set free transaction policies uh, for the types of assets, for the types of transactions that go through their smart contracts. Uh, and the idea here is that you should be able to really reference any type of on-chain or off-chain data needed in a seamless fashion to be able to set these types of policies that might involve some type of uh, pre-transaction compute, essentially. So to make that a little bit more specific, uh, example, a few examples that I can give is an application that is concerned about facilitating illicit finance, so assets originating from sanctioned addresses, can use the Athos policy engine to essentially prevent any assets coming from a sanctioned address from going through their application. Uh, another example could be preventing uh, the movement of stolen funds. So, you know, there's an exploit. Let's say there's an exploit on a bridge. And a DEF application may say, look, we don't actually want to receive all these assets coming in from the exploit because our community is fundamentally not OK with that. Uh, and so essentially having those types of pieces in place. And then I think another one that we've talked about that we're working on with EtherFi as well as, as, well as looking at from an LRT standpoint is you can actually create policies for uh, gamification. Uh, so, you know, competing, completing certain activities on chain, whether that is, you know, uh, participating in something like EtherFi Liquid uh, to then explore kind of new higher yield vaults that might come about because you've done all these different things that are on chain as well as off chain and not necessarily just on that one chain, but you might have other types of activities. Mm -hmm. So how can you actually gamify experiences? And usually one of the big challenges when you're trying to do these kinds of things is the need to add complexity to your smart contracts. So how do you incorporate all these types of logic and rule systems in your smart contract it starts becoming increasingly complex. Um, and so what we're trying to do is actually abstract that away. Can we create a system in which the application, the ecosystem can seamlessly update those policies without needing to go and say, hey, we need to update our contracts every single time we want to make any type of change. Uh, and then the last piece I'll add here as well is the policies themselves should be something that can be owned by a community or an ecosystem. It doesn't have to always be owned by a, a central labs entity. 
So as protocols decentralize, they can say, hey, these policies can be owned and governed by ecosystems and updated by them. Uh, and so for us, actually, the AVS part is crucial here, where you know we work with folks like EtherFi for the economic security. Because the underlying technical infrastructure involves a network of operators. And so these operators, who are you know different operators economically incentivized via uh, liquid restaking assets, are responsible for issuing signatures. Um, so the flow here works in which an application integrates the Athos network, and then they set a policy. The operators then say, hey, this transaction is coming into the smart contract of this application. Does the transaction adhere to the policy that's been set? If it does, the operator issues a signature. And essentially, the transaction only goes through if it receives signatures from the operator network um, saying that, hey, this transaction mm -hmm. is good. It fits the policy. If it doesn't, the operators don't issue a signature and the transaction doesn't go through. And where the economic stake becomes really important with, with, uh, with liquid I restaking see. is the fact that you actually want the operators to not act maliciously. If the operators act maliciously and impose their own policy, it, it, it's actually a huge danger for the protocol or the application because the operators can say, we're going to do whatever we want. And so having economic stake here ensures that the operators don't act maliciously and they're, they're essentially incentivized to, to issue signatures when they should be. And those operators are operators of Eigenlayer. That's correct, yeah. They're operators of Eigenlayer who are economically incentivized uh, the Eigenlayer. So they're operators who have essentially set up, they're partnering with different liquid restaking protocols and saying, hey, we, we're able to kind of add your network and uh, essentially support what you guys are doing. So in the case of someone like EtherFi, we basically work with operators who have partnered with EtherFi. Okay, and the, so this is, this is interesting because you have this specific DAP um, that the service you're providing is, again, to add policies to different smart contracts. So it's a service that any external app can use. Um, for you know whatever their own use case is, but the idea is that you you want your transactions to happen if there are specific rules that align, right? Uh, and so you provide the smart contracts in order for for that to execute. But what what's happening here is instead of going off and building, you know, a separate um, network for this to work where you'd have to uh, bootstrap your own security, your own nodes, uh, your own capital to incentivize these nodes, all of that. You are using Eigenlayer, EtherFi, like the whole restaking existing ecosystem to, um, to bootstrap your security and uh, get a lot more capital uh, towards your 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 DAP from the get go, rather than having to you know build that from scratch. Exactly, it's either we would take that approach, which ensures an economic security in a decentralized model, or alternatively, we could have built a highly centralized execution in which you're trusting me and our labs entity to say, hey, we will make sure we validate these transactions. But when it comes to a smart contract execution, mm -hmm. you don't want a centralized vulnerability. You don't want to trust me to say, oh yeah, I'll make sure that I'm still here and I'm validating transactions. You want to have a decentralized, you want to have a decentralized network to have a trust minimized system that uh, can't be something that, that avoids centralized points of failure. There's actually a, a couple of different uh, ways that we're working together with, with Athos. Um, and um, uh, I maybe can add a little bit to the significance of well, like why, why this matters. So there's, there's two specific ways. So one is EtherFi is providing $500 million of uh, security to Athos. So Athos can then go out to their potential customers and say, hey, we have $500 million of security. You should trust us as a policy engine because that $500 million and, and more that they're going to get from other LRTs uh, uh, is going to facilitate this you know, tremendous amount of trust that, uh, that is in their policy engine. The second thing is EtherFi is going to be using Athos as a policy engine for our systems. And mm. th there's a lot potentially that we could be doing here, for example, with the Liquid Vault and with the Liquid stake Staking Token itself. But it's sort of this bi-directional thing where they agree to use 500 million uh, of EtherFi security and, uh, you know, in ex not in exchange, but in addition to that, we, we agree to use their 
uh, their services. So it's this kind of mutually beneficial thing. And the significance of that is that there's been all this hype around restaking an eigenlayer. Theoretically, there's going to be all this great stuff that gets built and, and gets, gets used. Um, but th th there has been a question of like, all right, is this going to materialize? Because right now there is no restaking, right? It has launched mm -hmm. on, on mainnet. So uh, this is an instance, of one of the first instances where here there's an actual transaction happening on the eigenlayer network. In other words, there's a, a company, Athos, and then there's Etherfy that are working together to uh, to make use of uh, it through restaking of this $500 million worth of uh uh, ETH. Uh, so if you think of Eigenlayer as like the Amazon marketplace, if EtherFi as a seller and of uh, Athos as a buyer, uh, th this is w the deal that we've struck is basically this tr a transaction on that marketplace. So it's one of the first transactions on that marketplace, and that's that's quite significant and exciting because it shows that look, there are people that are willing to actually uh, you know pay some amount in exchange for this. Uh, uh, the security and as Etherfy, that's great for us because we get to pass on these uh, the rewards, higher rewards from from selling the seed security to our users. So our stakers get to earn uh, uh, additional uh, rewards on top of uh, normal uh, staking. And then, as I said, Athos is able to go out there and close lots of deals uh, because now they've got all this economic security. The one other thing I want to add there too is that the great part here is that. We both are leveraging the economics. We're leveraging the economic security of EtherFi and liquid restaking, but then we can say, "Hey, look! Like, it's not just that this is sitting in isolation where we're like we're borrowing the security, but we're not doing anything with it." In this case, we can actually turn that and say, "Hey, we can actually draw like provide value to your ecosystem as well for defined use cases that you're building." Uh, and that's like the big emphasis here that Mike mentioned is a bi-directional aspect of. Uh, Eigenlayer talks a lot about infinite sum games, and this is an infinite sum game. You're having the economic security from restaking, but in turn, that restaking is used to support applications that are powered by the restaking itself. Ready to dive into the world of on-chain derivatives? Sin Futures is your decentralized portal to trading futures and perps with up to 100x leverage. Now live on Blast Mainnet, Sin Futures V3 combines limit orders and concentrated liquidity into a single unified liquidity model dubbed Oyster AMM offering unparalleled capital efficiency. Earn triple airdrop rewards through an incentive program designed around Blast and Sin Future Points. And join the new Trading Grand Prix competition to win a piece of the $500,000 prize pool. Visit sinfutures.com, that's S-Y-N futures.com to start your decentralized trading journey today. This is super interesting um, and the you know, I, I guess I had misunderstood a part of how uh, Eigenlayer works because I thought that uh, ABSs built on top of Eigenlayer could leverage, you know, any any uh, staked ETH that was in the system. I didn't realize that there had to be, you know, specific allocations of uh, restaked ETH to each specific AVS that's building on Eigenlayer. So is, is that how it how it works? Yeah, it is. So it's, it has to be sort of mutually whitelisted. So we mm. need to whitelist each AVS that we, we plan to secure. And we've made the commitment that we will whitelist all AVSs that uh, are part of the first batch that I, I, Eigenlayer releases. Uh, uh, the reason for that is because we are committed, uh, along with Eigenlayer, to this pooled security model um, where you know the, the entire pool of ETH is used to secure AVSs. Um, and then uh, the other side of it is every AVS makes the decision about what ETH they will choose to accept for their, their security. So this mm. this deal is like us mutually saying, yeah, we, we agree to use, uh, uh, you know, we agree to provide the security and, and Athos is agreeing to, uh, to use it. So right now there's, I think, like, how, how much? Is it like 10 billion? 12 billion Something like that, yeah. in, in Eigenlayer. So how how is all of that allocated to all the different AVSs? Um, well, it's it's not. I mean, that's it's uh, uh, th that is the I guess what, what is going to happen over the coming uh, months is mm -hmm. um, uh, th there is a mismatch. I think that's the, the reality here mm -hmm. where there's a huge amount of ETH security being offered because everybody's been you know throwing tons of ETH into into Eigenlayer. 
Uh, and then on the other side, there, there's only a small number of ABSs, uh, relatively mm -hmm. uh, speaking. And so um, the market needs to find a clearing price, and the market needs to find utilization for some or, or all of that uh, ETH. Um, but I think part of that process is exactly the stuff that uh, you know that we've been doing is is you know working with AVSs and making sure that uh, uh, ETH get you know finds utility so that it's mm -hmm. not um, um, a situation where like you know a lot of the ETH ends up sitting. Uh, sitting idle because that would be bad for for everybody right if if a whole bunch of eth ends up sitting idle uh that means there's not for the idle eth there's not going to be any additional rewards and then the result is you know everyone's just kind of sitting there uh wondering what all the fuss was about and we don't want that <laughs> so it's important right. to 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 sign these uh uh these agreements and make mm -hmm. sure that eth does in fact get utilized uh, for uh, for security and who is responsible for, I mean, so is it um, the responsibility of EtherFi and other liquid restaking protocols to do that, to, to allocate capital that way? Uh, or, or is Eigenlayer also involved in this process? Like, how, how will this all work? Yeah, it's a combination. I mean, it could happen in a completely, um, and, and some of it will happen this way in, in a sort of uh, open marketplace type uh, type model, right, where... Uh, I almost think of it like Ave or, or Compound, where uh, you know some people supply capital, on the other side there's demand, and it just magically kind of takes care of uh, itself. But it's not quite that simple because not all ETH is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who's looking at let's say our ETH or e ETH as you know as EtherFi or um, you know Alluvio ETH or Origin ETH, these are not the same things. Mm -hmm. Like one is not the same. So some AVSs will will have will make choices about like okay we like this ETH we don't you know we prefer not to take uh, this ETH. So that's where like the complexity of the market clearing dynamic is is going mm. to uh, come in. Um, and um, for us th th in the immediate term we plan to support lots of AVSs. Uh, in the longer term we we plan to uh, through a combination of governance and, and judgment and working with smart uh, third parties, we do plan to be very selective about which AVSs we, uh, we work with. Uh, we're, uh, we are, uh, as a protocol, going to play the role of risk manager to ensure that our users' you know, funds are, uh, are safe. Um, uh, and that requires making choices between pooled security, you know, attributable security, uh, and uh, how much ETH and how many layers of, uh, of AVSs we, you know, we uh, secure using that uh, that ETH. So lots of choices that you know have to be made, uh, you know, here. Right, because I mean, yeah, uh, not all ETH is equal, but obviously there's there's a much bigger difference between all the different AVSs. So that's another another exactly. choice to make. It's like yeah, exactly. Uh, you you want to make sure that uh, your ETH is going towards securing reputable, you know, quality uh, projects. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so, Nikhil, uh, on that, uh, how how will uh, Athos generate yield? Uh, you know, I mean, because that's a point, right? Like people are staking their ETH to get more yield generated by AVSs. Yeah, so the way we think about kind of our protocol revenue model in the long term is essentially we sit between the end user and an application that they might interact with, right? And so in that step where a user is submitting a transaction, we sit in the middle of that. And so there's an economic opportunity there. Similar, to, and I think parallels you can draw comparison to are something like cross-chain messaging, right? So if you go and bridge an asset, you're sitting in the middle between one when, with, between one blockchain and another, and usually bridges accrue some type of value. In the same way, Oracle systems, also if you're interacting with a smart contract that's using some type of outside price for an Oracle, they're accruing value. So in the same way, it's where we're seeing is that economic opportunity that comes about in the middle. What we'll also think about there as well is having a token that essentially powers some of that system. So a token that is issued in which you have some form of emission schedule as well as being used as a dual staking for the overall protocol uh, for Athos, uh, as well as other things that we can incorporate. But I think this is something that we'll have to kind of build out over time. Um, but I think the main aspect of where we think of revenue and how you generate value to restakers is by sitting in between applications and end users um, in that flow. So basically, sitting in between means taking some, some sort of cut of the transactions that you are setting rules for or like policy for, right? 
That's right, yeah. Or it could also be, you know, in some cases for certain foundation entities. For example, uh, one example is we're working with a large blockchain for their canonical bridge. Uh, and so in that case, that L1 foundation would likely subsidize those fees uh, because they're going to say, hey, there's going to be fees that are going to be imposed on users, but instead of the user paying, the, the foundation itself can cover those fees. So you'll see a mix of, in some instances, the application team or a foundation entity will say, hey, we'll cover these costs that are necessary for the economic security as well as covering the overhead of operators. Um, but again, it, it just varies project by project and what's the best mechanism for uh, uh, essentially uh, integrating that. So how, how big do you think the market is, uh, or uh, yeah, how much demand do you think there is for uh, DAF protocols who require these policies for their smart contracts? Yeah, so the biggest uh, item we've found so far has actually been in the compliance space. So any project that's starting to get bigger or ones that have had to kind of think about on-chain flow of funds from day one. So for example, some of the privacy protocols have had to think about this very actively. Token bridges have to think about this quite a bit because if they facil facilitate any type of financial activity uh, that involves uh, sanctioned entities, they are almost immediate, they're, they're pretty generally like contacted by the Department of Justice or another regulator. Um, and so you're seeing quite a bit of adoption there to start. But I think as you're seeing that aspect of complexity for smart contracts go up, you're only going to see more and more of those use cases. And I think you're seeing some of that in the security side of things as well, where how do you prevent an exploit from happening before it happens? Or if there's an exploit, how do you minimize its implications and its impact? So all of those regard, like all those essentially require some type of on-chain policy. Then the other thing we're seeing as well is kind of the introduction of hooks and more and more hooks. Uh, and so then you have a core protocol. But then with hooks, you have other types of customization that you might have. I think the best example from a, from a hook standpoint is something like a uni, Uniswap v4, um, where you can have different types of custom v4 hooks that are designed for different types of uh, players. Uh, so if you want an institutional pool, for example, you're going to need certain policies to even make any of that possible. Uh, otherwise, an institution can't really participate there. Uh, and so we'll see those kinds of aspects. And then the last one, I think, still a little bit longer way, but on-chain gaming, where as you start having more and more on-chain games, that is smart contract. That is smart contract uh, on complexity to a very high degree, right? Because you're trying to create rules based off of different types of on-chain activity. How do you unlock entering into a new world or unlock a new item? All those things are things that you need to abstract away. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, when we think of on-chain policies, it's any type of smart contract that has to incorporate any type of uh, arbitrary compute and uh, flow of funds um, both from on-chain as well as incorporating off-chain data. Perfect. And um, you mentioned some of the yield will also come from your own native token. Can you provide uh, more details on that? Like, um, is there a timeline or uh, are, you, are you rewarding uh, users now, like, um, yeah, uh, what, what's kind of the, the latest on your token? There's no immediate plan to launch a token. That's all I can say at the moment. But didn't, but didn't you just say that you that part of the yield will come from your own token? We would have a token eventually, but there's no immediate plan to launch a token. This is something that we would explore oh, okay. uh, later. So it's, it's, it's designs we've been exploring mm -hmm. and understanding, but there's no immediate kind of plan to launch a token as soon as we launch our initial network. Got it. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the yield will come from actual revenue, you know, from transactions taking place in your network. Yeah, that's right. It will come from any form of, there's different ways of thinking about initial yield. Um, and I think we'll kind of see how that evolves over time, especially since we're not live yet. And I think we'll, our plan is to go live in the summer, so we'll have a better understanding of that in the next few months. But uh, I think part of this, we'll see what are some of the, it will also depend on some of the initial implementations that we have and how those different partners essentially provide the, the mechanisms necessary to reward operators and uh, restakers. Awesome. Um, that's great to hear, actually. I, I think, so one of my, uh, or, or like the concerns that I, I have raised with um, restaking, liquid restaking, this the whole ecosystem, uh, I did a little video essay on this, was on just like the... Um, the risk of all this huge ecosystem and these billions of dollars really depending on the quality of these untested protocols being built on eigenlayer. Like right now we have 
uh, just 13 AVSs. And they, yeah, they're all pretty much, or, or most of them are, are, are brand new. Um, and Ethos uh, sounds great, but, you know, it is untested. So uh, I'd love for, for both of you to, to comment on, on this potential risk to this en- entire system. Yeah, look, there's, uh, there's tons of risk. I think it, it is important to, to acknowledge that. Uh, but I think uh, Eigenlayer is doing a, a pretty good job of uh, building training wheels uh, onto the system so that uh, they are allowing the system to, to grow up uh, before, you know, the really bad stuff uh, potentially starts happening. Um, so specifically, one of the things that uh, 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 is part of the system is that there actually are no slashing rules implemented. So when EigenDA and other AVSs go on mainnet, there, there is not going to be slashing. So it's, it's just a, the risk. Uh, there's some smart contract risk, but um, there is no slashing risk to, uh, to begin with. Uh, and even when the slashing rules do get implemented, there are going to be these um, anti-slashing committees so that when, if and when slashing does happen, then they reverse. Uh, they're able to reverse those, uh, uh, those slashing uh, conditions. Um, so, so there's a lot of uh, training wheels, uh, as I said, being put onto the system probably for the first year that this thing is going to be running. I don't know if, what the exact time frame is, but let's, for the sake of argument, let's say roughly the first, uh, the first year. Uh, and I think that'll be a, a fair, like a, a good test of the system where you're going to have a dozen, potentially more AVSs running in the wild on mainnet with these protections, you know, in in place uh, uh, that uh, that allows to develop some level of uh, maturity. However, however, when the system becomes fully permissionless, which I think everybody intends for it to to become, um, uh, you're gonna ha- you're gonna see some really crazy stuff, right? I mean, you can imagine pr- pretty trivially building an AVS, so a restaking service that just you know you restake in it and either doubles your money or you lose everything. Right, that that you could build an AVS pretty trivially that just uh, does that, and someone will. I guarantee it. Someone's gonna someone's gonna make that, um, and so you are going to have situations where there's going to be, for example, liquid restaking protocols that just you know go all in on everything, maximum leverage, maximum uh, degen, you know, 500 layers of uh, restaking on top of them, and it's just a constant sort of chaotic thing of rewards and slashing. And then there's going to be boring LRTs, which I, I consider Etherfy among among those, um, that are much more careful, much more curated in terms of the AVSs and the, the number of layers we uh, we take on to manage uh, risk. Uh, I mean, our motto is going to be uh, the boring LRT. We're not going to have the highest uh, reward rates, uh, but we're, we're going to do the very best job that we can to keep user funds from getting, uh, getting slashed. But uh, I think... Um, Really, a year from now is when all the really crazy stuff is going to start happening. On our end, I mean, actually kind of echoing this aspect of how do you launch to start. For us, we won't fully reveal, like, we won't have a fully public mainnet. It'll start with a private mainnet that makes sure that by having a private mainnet, you start with some initial integrations and you have a permission network of operators, especially since there's no slashing conditions. And so that's kind of the process that we'll take is before opening everything up, you want to have some initial implementations. You want to put them on a test net. You want to make sure all those things work before you reveal more and more of it uh, live. And I think that's the process we'll take, especially given that there's a lot of stuff that we still have to figure out and uh, slashing conditions won't be live on day one. And so we have to be really cognizant of all these types of things. And then on our end, when we, I think Mike was thinking about, Mike was saying, you know, how like there'll be the boring uh, LRT. What really our end goal is just having a stable form of revenue that doesn't have to be really spiky, but something that's relatively stable, that is pretty boring, that is really just, hey, people are transacting and using uh, different applications. They're not, they may not even realize we're using Athos on the back end. And in the meantime, we're just kind of generating economic value that's then uh, supporting different LRTs. One that is very stable, one that's very predictable, and one that, uh, from our operator standpoint, have a, they have a very good understanding of what is needed to avoid uh, any form of slashing. So there's these training wheels, which is to um, remove slashing, I think, for the first few months. But isn't, you know, how, I mean, isn't slashing an incentive for node operators to behave? So, so I mean, can, can that also add another risk vector? 
Um, I think right now, and this is actually, a, I guess, to some extent, a problem. Right now, the only node operators that are running uh, AVSs and you know participating in restaking are professional node operators, and so they they have a tremendous amount of reputational risk that's associated with n- not doing a, a good job. I mean, they make in in most cases millions and millions of dollars, you know, running uh, nodes and and staking uh, ETH for people, um, and so. If suddenly they misbehave and suddenly they, they don't do a very good job running these uh, these ABSs, um, the their trust level is is going to uh, trustworthiness level is going to uh, come down substantially, and then people will just move their ETH to other uh, uh, node operators. And so I think um, it's certainly a risk. I, I wouldn't put that risk as being particularly high. Um, I think uh, you know all that we we have about I want to say fifteen node operators that we're working with, um, uh, which is not a huge number. We actually we want a lot more than that, and um, and more importantly, frankly, we want solo stakers to be able to participate. And right now, the complexity of restaking has almost completely boxed out solo stakers. I mean, there's just no there's no practical way for a solo staker to a onboard themselves as an operator on eigenlayer. Because the bar is quite high, and then even if they do, you, you know, imagine a solo staker running, you know, fifteen different Docker containers on their little machine on their desk, uh, and trying to maintain good uptime. Um, it's just, uh, it's not practical. So um, we are working on, and, and others are, are working on figuring out how to bring solo stakers into the fold. My guess is it probably will involve using some form of DVT, distributed validator technology, or or running a remote signer. Uh, and delegating the, a lot of the node operation to, to other operators. So, um, but that's something that's still very much in uh, in flux. Mm, got it. Okay. So maybe for for an, a next generation or a, a next version of Eigenlayer, we'll, we'll see more a more decentralized model for operators. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is. Um, I mean, there's for sure Eigenlayer can do some some work to make it uh, easier. A, a lot of it has to do with the. Um, Infrastructure and tooling, like a, a, you know, it really needs to be so easy to run a node that you know you you download an app, click install, and it just kind of runs in the background. Like that's really what we need to get to. Uh, but even running a vanilla Ethereum node is not that simple right now. There, I mean, there there really aren't any services that I'm aware of that you can just download an app and and go. Uh, that is something we we have talked about building and we want to build to make it super easy for people to buy a. You know, a DAP node or a little computer that they can sit on their desk uh, or in their office and not uh, not really have to babysit it because right now it requires a lot of babysitting uh, to run even a vanilla Ethereum loan, let alone, as I said, 15 AVSs, each with their own little Docker container running on top of everything and managing all the delegations and approvals and all that. Like that, uh, that gets quite complicated. Mm, okay, so so right now, when when you are restaking, you are you are putting some. I mean, yeah, you're putting trust on these 15 or so node operators yeah. to, you know, behave and uh, take care of your funds, <laughs> basically. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Th- that's true with Lido or, or any yeah. other service that uses professional operators. You are relying on those professional operators, uh, mostly their reputational uh, uh, risk. That's that's mm-hmm. sort of the collateral they're putting up is their their reputations. This is important. Solana is having their largest community conference called Solana Crossroads in less than a month. There will be over 3,000 plus attendees coming to Istanbul. Speakers include Anatoly Yakovenko, Raul Paul, Ansem, and basically everyone you'd want to see from the Solana ecosystem. From what I understand, tickets are almost sold out, so be sure to check the link in the description. There's also been this criticism of restaking uh, from people who say that it's it's kind of going back to tradfi rehypothecation um, and you know and kind of using the same asset uh, twice and you know all the the potential problems uh, that might uh, come with that. What do you guys think about that take? Well, it's different than TradFi in that it's transparent. I mean, I think that's the the real the difference between TradFi and you know and, and the way these systems are built in crypto is crypto is one transparent, uh, so you know what's actually what's happening, um, and two, it's non-custodial. So a user is 
you know, whether Etherfy or, or another protocol, they're depositing their ETH and then they can pull it out. There may be a delay. There may be, you know, a set of like hoops you have to jump through, but nobody can stop you from getting your ETH uh, or your assets out. It is truly, you know, self uh, self custodied, and so. Um, there's a parallel there in, the, in that this this introduces additional risk. It lets people play further out on the risk curve than, you know, essentially, you know, zero or close to zero risk. Um, um, I, you know, th- th- there's different ways to do that, right? Like just like in TradFi, you can just, you know, go crazy and uh, get, uh, you know, play the, the role of the turkey where you're getting lots of gains and then eventually you get, you know, cut down to, to zero. Um, in the same way, in crypto, that's uh, that's almost a kind of a commonplace uh, scenario, but uh, but that doesn't mean you have to do that, right? You you can be thoughtful and careful and more methodical about the the risk that uh, you're you're taking, so that you don't uh, expose yourself to you know kind of unlimited uh, rehypothecation and and potential leverage in, in the system. And I think relatedly, right? So if you think of normally when you're using crypto economic security and you're not using ETH, you're using some native asset. The crypto economic security is always limited by that asset that you're using. And so the awkward part here is if you're powering an application that's on Ethereum, let's say, and you're using a different asset, the security then, the biggest security vulnerability then actually comes down to your native token that's not related to ETH whatsoever. And even though you're on an Ethereum blockchain, your application is vulnerable. The security of the application is vulnerable to your native asset. Uh, and so in this case, it's the, the finance, like the, the TradFi example would be like, you know, you're using a collateral, but you're using collateral for some, for, for some type of financial activity. But in this case, your collateral is not nearly as robust as a U.S. dollar. And you're instead using something else. Maybe it's like oranges, like it could be a commodity. And so in that case, you're using something like Eigenlayer is actually really valuable when you think of various use cases where you're like, hey, we need robust economic security one that we know that is something that has been trusted, something that has a strong amount of like value in the industry, uh, that's really powerful. And I think one other thing that Eigenler has talked about is over time, of course, you can look at how you can have dual staking of those assets as well as incorporating other assets as well that can be used for economic security. It's just much more robust than trying to bootstrap a token from the very get-go that you don't actually know how how strong of an how strong of an asset that is as to provide as your security and use that as a foundations for everything. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. But um, with the caveat, I think that it's it's not really as simple as ETH itself providing security for for all these AVSs, right? It's versions of ETH, like so it's Lido staked ETH or you know whatever. Um, state ETH receipt that, that you're using. And so those derivatives also have risk in them. Like if something happens to Lido or something happens to, you know, whatever, um, there's that kind of potential DPEG or, you know, uh, I guess like, yeah, like a DPEG is kind of the biggest risk there, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think Mike had mentioned earlier that there's going to be different value for different types of uh, assets that are being used. And that's actually a really important consideration then of, wait, so what are the risks of those underlying assets? It's not, we can't treat it as the equivalent of, of ETH. If we treat it as the equivalent of ETH, I think that's a wrong way of thinking about it from a risk framework. Um, but can it at least be better than issuing a new asset potentially? Um, but I agreed, though, that we do have to be really particular on understanding what is the asset that's being used as collateral, because there's going to be a different sets of assets that one could use. And I think it will be re- a responsibility of ABS is to really say, hey, which asset are we actually thinking about here? Yeah, and there's, uh, I think that's a very important point, because there are uh, substantial differences between the, the various assets. I mean, one thing that absolutely blows my mind, uh, for example, is that um, the only there's only two liquid staking tokens that actually offer redemptions. Um, and that's Lido's ST ETH and Etherfy's EETH. Um, all, uh, as far as I, I know, with all other liquid staking or restaking tokens, there is no redemption mechanism. You can never, <laughs> there is no what? mechanism by which you can For sort of say- For some reason, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> it blows, uh, yeah, it's, it, it just blows your mind. It, people have put billions of dollars into these things. And you, uh, and you can uh, never take your ETH back? You can't take your ETH back. You have to swap uh, for it on chain. And all of them are depegged to some degree. Some of them are depegged by 10, 15%. So people are putting money into these things knowing that they're getting an asset that is, you know, is, is trading at 10 or 15 below 
uh, par. Um, and that's absolutely why. So that creates a tremendous amount of risk because if somebody's levering up on an asset that has the ability to depeg, you know, 5, 10, 20 percent or, or more, uh, that can very easily lead to a liquidation cascade. And again, some of these assets are, um, um, are uh, you know, there's billions of them, you know, with, with various states of leverage uh, that, uh, that people have uh, taken out on them. Um, actually, you know what? Sorry, I, I just realized I'm wrong. Swell recently introduced uh, redemptions. I don't want to... I didn't want to misspeak. So it's, I guess, there's three LSTs that I'm aware of that now have redemptions. So, um, so, uh, so that's problematic. But even with redemptions, even with assets like EtherFi, let's say, that have redemption, there's still risks because if there's a huge, you know, amount of redemption requests that uh, that come in, then it may very well be that we need to exit validators in order to fulfill those, uh, not we, but the system needs to exit validators uh, in order to fulfill those redemption requests. And the validator queue could be, uh, you know, almost arbitrarily long. It could be days, weeks, it could be months if there's a huge amount of unstaking that's uh, that's taking place. Uh, uh, and that in itself can also lead to depegging. So uh, people absolutely should be super careful with any kind of leverage that they, they take on on LSTs or LRTs because it's... Um, it's a very dangerous. Uh, it's a very dangerous thing to be to be doing. So I would frankly advise anybody not to take any leverage uh, on these things, which is um, uh, sounds absurd in a market where like you know five, ten, even twenty x leverage is seemingly the the norm. Uh, I'm just uh, I would just caution people not to do that. I would I would just say do not take leverage on LSTs. It's just it's generally a bad idea. And so what happens if if there's a, a DPEG and just like a skating? Uh, liquidations on all these leveraged uh, LRTs. Yeah, if, if something like um, uh, like a Lido depegs by let's say five percent, uh, I, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I mean we're, we're talking like Armageddon here. We're talking tens of billions of dollars of liquidations. I, I haven't looked at the latest math and numbers, but we're talking massive, massive amounts of cascading liquidations, and not just on Lido because. Lido, will, that that cascade of liquidations will crash, absolutely crash the price of ETH, which means everything else, which basically trades, you know, one to one with ETH, because like all all these, every token in the Ethereum ecosystem has pools, is, is in a pool with with ETH, right? Basically, every token has token plus ETH uh, pool. So if the price of ETH crashes, then all these tokens start uh, uh, necessarily, you know, in a, 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 a cor in a correlated manner, start crashing as well. And so you're going to see this cascade of liquidations of not just Lido leverage, but like ETH leverage and every other token that's uh, that's paired with, uh, with ETH. So uh, it really is kind of an Armageddon uh, scenario. And there's, there are a lot of different ways, not to pick on Lido because every LST has this issue, but but because it's just the largest, there are lots of ways for it to depeg. It's not just, uh, you know, oh, smart contract hack or, or, you know, long queues for ETH unstaking. Uh, uh, there, there is a lot of different ways that it could, it could go wrong. Um, and so it is... Um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a pretty uh, scary situation, um, depending how bad uh, how bad things get. And what about for for a smaller LST? Like, say you really trust Lido, like nothing's gonna happen. But um, there's lots of smaller ones. Maybe it doesn't have as a dramatic effect on in all of DeFi. But what could the effect be in the whole kind of chain of of, like the restaking ecosystem like what happens to like the ABSs or yeah there's there, there, uh, right now uh, there's a massive amount of ETH that's inside of Pendo uh, I think three billion dollars or so of ETH uh, or of stuff inside of Pendo uh, and that's just like a leverage you know uh, system right mm -hmm. um, people, are, people are levering up on the uh, on the yield so if people's confidence in that Declines that could lead to a lot of instability in those uh, in those pools, and prices could get very uh, very wacky. Um, so that could be uh, dangerous. There's uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of elements of the system that are untested. They've only been around uh, at scale during bull markets, and um, uh, <laughs> bull markets don't last. Sometimes bull mm -hmm. markets last days. Sometimes they last months. Uh, every once in a while, they last you know a year or two. So eventually, it's going to turn, and uh, a lot of these untested systems are going to get tested. And um, uh, again, I would just caution people to be very careful uh, with it. Um, Nikhil, how as a builder, like 
how how would you advise uh, your users or yeah or just like as a participant in in DeFi um, to protect themselves in in the case that something does go wrong in uh, liquid staking? I would not take too much leverage. I think is really what what I would do, given that you're not able to kind of remove your assets in all cases, as Mike talked about extensively. Um, the more leverage you take, the higher risk you take on, right? And so really at the end of the day, it's being really cognizant of how much risk you're taking on and being the more leverage you take, the more comfortable you should be of losing all of it. Um, that kind of comes with the game, right? So if you're increasing your yield by a dramatic amount because you're taking more and more leverage, that means that you should be very comfortable with the chance of losing all of it. So that's what I would say. Um, and that's why even when we think of, that's one consideration we have from an AVS standpoint, right, is if you start seeing more and more of these types of leverage activities, what is the exposure that it has on an AVS? And that's something we'll have to understand over time is in the case of any of these assets that you have as your collateral, if there's more leverage being taken by users, by AVSs themselves, by LRTs themselves, what is the exposure that an AVS has? And that's something that we'll see over time. Summer.fi is aimed to be the best place to borrow and earn in DeFi. Wonder why? It's a hub to access the best protocols, including Maker, Aave, Ethina, Aina, Spark, and Bar. The access to all of these protocols is better in Summer because of its risk management automation tools, like stop loss and trailing stop loss, auto buy, auto sell, and take profit. More than 4.6 billion manage nearly 230 million total collateral automated with 100% success rate. Your DeFi will be better on Summer. Yeah, there's there's a lot of obvious. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of risks for for AVSs, for sure. Because if if the the thing that's backing your your whole network has, if there's a lot of uh, leverage that has attached to those assets, uh, there's the potential for those assets to you know crash, um, and 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 maybe uh, for for a crash to be magnified. Uh, if you know all, all these uh, all these pools are uh, liquidated, um, so yeah, it's like your your network security uh, depends on the the quality of these collaterals and on um, the fact that you know there's a lot of degens out there <laughs> wanting to take a lot of leverage on on these uh, on these assets. Yeah, so I think that goes back to something we very briefly touched on earlier. It, which is that not all ETH security is the same. Um, hmm. For example, ETH security from an LRT that doesn't have redemptions, I, objectively, is probably a lot more uh, risky than ETH security from something that, let's say, has a redemption. So ETH hmm. security from restaked LSTs, this is like, there's this distinction with Eigenlayer where you can restake LSTs or you can do native restaking, which is where you're actually spinning up validators on, on Eigenlayer, which is what, what EtherFi does. And uh, just objectively, natively restaked Ether a lot is a much stronger security guarantee than uh, uh, than LST restaking from a smart contract risk standpoint and risk of this uh, sort of depegging cascade liquidations thing. So um, uh, I think th there, uh, there there is going to be a flight to safety, especially um if and when some of these like more you know black swan scenarios end up uh, uh, you know actualizing, I think there is going to be a flight to safety in terms of uh, uh, restaking solutions that uh, take a more conservative approach. I think that's um, uh, that's really what playing the long game I think looks like is uh, is taking a bit more of a boring approach that maybe in the short term you're not getting uh, you know yields that are as uh, as high, but uh, your uh, you know you end up not being a turkey uh, when uh, when bad stuff happens. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, to start wrapping up, if you can both uh, go um, get into kind of the, the next milestones you're looking at, uh, Mike, you had mentioned that you're uh, you're building new products on, on top of EtherFi. Um, so yeah, we'd we'll love to hear about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can uh, just quickly summarize. We... we mm -hmm. Uh, the the near term roadmap of EtherFi is to build this trilogy of products, so three interrelated products that make it easy for normal people to use uh, DeFi. Uh, that's the the goal. The first product was EtherFi Stake, 
which is the liquid restaking product, which we've mostly talked about now. The second product is EtherFi Liquid, which is an automated DeFi strategy vault. Uh, that vault, which we launched just uh, just a few days ago, is already about 150 million in uh, in TVL, which is incredible. That actually makes it the largest DeFi strategy vault in in all of DeFi. Uh, and pretty soon, Liquid as as a whole will probably be the the largest uh, you know uh, yield aggregation um, uh, product in in DeFi, which is amazing. Just uh, you know, shortly after after launch, uh, and then the third product that we're aiming to launch is called EtherFi Cash. Which is uh, think of it as a spending account that allows you to actually use your 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 assets in uh, in real life through a uh, sort of a prepaid credit card that uh, where the credit card loan actually gets repaid automatically with your uh, you know your your rewards from uh, staking and, and restaking, um, uh, which we think is a pretty exciting uh, product. So together, EtherFi staking, EtherFi stake, liquid and cash allows you to save, invest, and spend. Your 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 money in a crypto native uh, uh, way, in a fully transparent, non custodial way, which we think is uh, is great, and will help help onboard you know hopefully a large number of users into into crypto who uh, don't want to deal with the complexities of uh, uh, of a lot of DeFi. Well, wow, that's crazy. So so you're launching like two completely different products besides having the largest <laughs> liquid restaking protocol out there that's insane yeah i mean it's they're they're different but related they're very mm. tied and integrated so with liquid you take your ee that you mint the stake product uh, and and deploy it into uh, into liquid and with cash it's bas- the structure of it is it's an mpc wallet and mobile app that will have a credit card attached to it uh, that you'll be able to use in uh, in real life so in aggregate cool. now you can just sort of live live in crypto so is uh, is this uh, liquid dap is is it competing with yearn? Is it like similar to yearn? It's similar to yearn. I mean, I don't know mm-hmm. that people are really making a choice between us and and yearn. You know, we're, we love the the yearn team, um, but it is a, it's in the same category as yearn. Mm-hmm. Exactly, it's an integrated DeFi strategy vault. And with cash, is it a physical credit card? It will be a physical credit card. Yeah, that, that will be part of it, and a mobile app. Is it specific to certain geographies? Like, where, where can it be used? Probably launch in, uh, in the EU first. Um, we're still, I mean, the, the, it's still very early days for the, the cash product, uh, but it'll probably launch in the EU first, and the components of it will be a mobile app on your phone, iPhone, Android, a uh, physical card that you can use, and the, that'll be plugged into your EtherFi. Uh, Aniku, what's next for Ethos? Yeah, so we're launching our private alpha network on our alpha mainnet by end of April, early May. So shortly after Eigenlayer goes live, we'll be one of the first AVSs that goes live. Uh, that's the start. Uh, that lets us basically start working on integrations with different partners, which then segues into our private mainnet launch, which would be in uh, basically in Q2. So let's say in the summer, uh, and where we'll have private mainnet use cases with a few different projects, which we haven't announced yet. So we're going to be announcing those in the, the next few weeks slash months as well of different use cases for the Athos policy engine itself. To wrap up, I'd love both of your views on um, where you'd like to see the liquid staking ecosystem uh, by the end of the year. Like if everything goes right, what does the ecosystem look like? I think for me, it's seeing a, a set of a lot of different AVSs that are live that are using liquid restaking. Right. And seeing like, what are those best practices? What are those models? I think there's going to be a lot of different ways to think to think about how to bootstrap economic security. I think there's been a lot of discussion around using point systems as well before a project launches a token. There's a lot of research that has to happen there. Um, I'm very curious to see as well, like as you start having different AVS go live as well as then, hey, like what is the price for borrowing security and what is the price for, you know, different assets? It's not all going to be the same. And so how does a market end up deciding that? Because right now there is no market. There's no real way of figuring out what the best price is. Uh, And so the evolution of that, I think, will be really, really powerful. Um, And then I think the last part is then, like, especially as we start coming into slashing conditions, what are the risk adjusted returns for ABSs and how does one calculate that? And how do by calculating those different risk adjusted returns, you'll start seeing also difference in correlations between those different returns as well. So that will result in kind of potentially different shared security models and pools and uh, tra- almost like tranches. Um, and I think that's where it gets really interesting, right? Because then you'll say, okay, so 
us as an AVS, what is our risk adjusted return? How does it relate to another one? What is the correlation or lack of correlation? And then based off of that, you then end up working with different LRTs and different operators accordingly. Yeah, I think uh, it's always hard to make longish term forecasts, but uh, my hope is that uh, restaking becomes the default and, um, uh, you know, restaking LSTs flip uh, vanilla LSTs. I think um, I really think there's a reasonable chance of that uh, of that happening. Um, and then bro- more broadly, I guess, for crypto, I, I really hope that uh, crypto and DeFi moves beyond the one or two million users that are currently on it so that uh, it actually starts to become more accessible to, uh, to normal people. Perfect. This was great. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating chat. Uh, this whole ecosystem is really mind-blowing. Um, we're watching a new vertical rise in DeFi, you know, basically from the round, ground up. Like, this didn't exist six months ago. Um, and you guys are at the forefront of it. So uh, thanks again for taking the time to chat with me. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us.